The first one is a gentleman. He's right-handed. He has some history of PTSD and high blood pressure. And we saw him in the emergency room because of an episode of left sided weakness and maybe some slurred speech. Uh, he was not clear the speech problem uh, that he was having. We were not sure if it was really a problem of word finding or slurring of the speech, but his speech was definitely different. And unfortunately, it, it had happened the day before. He never had episodes like this in the past. His family history was not contributory. And he really didn't have any toxic habit, no cigarette smoking, no illicit drug use, not any history of alcohol use. Uh, next, I think Genevieve has to go. Okay, so for his hypertension, he was taking hydrochloric and thorium terrain, and he was taking the nifedipine, the calcium channel blocker, once a day. And then you can see the vital signs. So they called a stroke alert. We went to the emergency room. His blood pressure was 49, the systolic. The heart rate was 65. Respirations were 18. He was a febrile. His BMI was 24. And when we did the neurological exam, he did have weakness, three over five on the upper extremity. On the left side, the left leg was a little bit stronger than the arm, four over five. He did have some slurred speech. His nasolabial fold on the left side was decreased and he had a positive Babinski and Babinski was present on the left side. Next. These are the labs when we saw him initially. Uh, his A1C was 6.3, so it was at normal. His LDL was 124, his HDL was 80. His total cholesterol was 170 and the triglycerides was 111. So we admitted the patient and did the brain MRI and we saw that he had really in the medial temporal lobe. It was in the right insula, but it was extending into the coronary data. We look at his blood vessels of the brain and of the neck with an MR angiogram. So we proceeded to do a brain and a neck MR angiogram. And he had some mild plaque in both carotids, but they were very, very non-significant, not flow limiting. And his circle of Willis was complete without any stenosis. Next, maybe, okay. Now, when we did his echo studies, he had a good ejection fraction. All his walls were more moving. The size of his chambers, especially the right, and the left atrium were normal. But in the bubble study, he had a shunt, what we call a right to left shunt. His EKG had sinus bradycardia, but nothing else. We did a Doppler, the lower extremities, a venous Doppler that was negative. And doing cardiac telemetry all the time, he was a normal. Next. So, oh. Can you see this, Jeremy? Can you see the pointer though here? My pointer? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So here is the area of the stroke, right? It's very medial temporal lobe in the right um, insula. Next. And if you go a little bit higher, you can see that he has dots on the flare that are consistent with some periventricular white matter disease. And this is part actually right here in the right parietal white matter part of the stroke that was extending a little bit deeper. Next. So since he had, he was young, he had not many vascular risk factors, only history of high blood pressure. But when we did the echo, he had a right to left shunt we decided to look for any problem of his clotting system. So we look for what we call hypercoagulable disorder, any disorder in the blood that might predispose him to have clots. So his was within normal limits. We look for the proton B mutation and the factor five. We did levels of protein C and S and antithrombin three. As you know, all these are actually cymogens or normal proteins produced usually by the liver. It's created renally, but they're part of the normal balance between the clotting and the bleeding system. The fibrinogen was normal. We check him for lupus anticoagulant and we check also his anticardiolipin antibodies. 
that as you know, are different type of antibodies, again, phospholipid in the membrane walls, including the walls uh, of the endothelial cells, and they have a propensity to clot but they were basically negative. The IgM was 14, that's sort of an intermediate range, not clearly significant. When you're looking for stroke, what you're looking is for high levels, especially of the anticardiolipin IgG. Next. And I want to discuss with you something interesting, right? Which is what we call the ROPE score. So the ROPE score is risk of paradoxical emboli. That's what it stands for. So when we have patients with stroke, like this patient, they came to our emergency room, relatively young with very little risk factors. Okay, very good. Before I go into that, I have a question. What does the cardiolipin IgM tells you versus the IgG? That's very important. So there are different type of immunoglobulins the IgM has not been associated significantly with increased stroke risk. So the IgG is the one that when we do serial studies has been it's, it, it associated with an increased risk of stroke. So that is part of what we call the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Okay, so that was really a good question. So when we look at all the different type of immunoglobulins, again, the phospholipids of the membrane walls, right? Uh, including the anticardiolipins, they can be IgG type, IgJ, IgA, or IgM. The one that has been associated with increased risk of stroke is specifically the one that's IgG. Okay, a so good question. That's a good question. Yes, so we're going to talk now about the right to left shunt and the PFO. Very good. So usually when you have a patient that has a right to left shunt, when you do a bubble study in the echocardiogram, that is usually consistent with a PFO. And we're gonna talk about that now. It's coming now in the next. So hold your questions about the PFO. Let me go over this. So the ROPE score is the risk of paradoxical embolism score. So what this score is, it tells you the probability that that right to left shunt consistent with a PFO in a patient with a stroke is actually the cause of the stroke. So basically, it's a score that you're going to use in patients like this that have very little risk factors that come with stroke and that have a shunt in the heart, consistent with the PFO. So basically, as you see, the score is one point if the patient does not have hypertension. You're going to give the patient one point if the patient does not have diabetes. If the patient has no, no prior history of stroke or TIA, you're going to give the patient another point. You're going to give the patient a point for non-smoker. If you have a stroke that it involves the cortex, which is what we call cortical, remember those are the ones that are more embolic, probably, you're going to give the patient another point. And the younger the patient is, the more points the patient gets. So if the patient has a stroke between age 18 to 29, that's five points. 30 to 39, four points. 40 to 49, three points. 50 to 59, two points. 60 to 69, one point. Greater than 70, no points. So what this tells you is that the younger the patient that has a stroke that involves the cortex and also has the right to left shunt in the echo, consistent with a PFO, the greater the probability that that stroke was due to that PFO. So if you look at the next slide, next one, Geneva. If the patient has a low rope score from zero to three, the, the probability that the PFO is the cause of the stroke is very little. Now, if the patient has a high rope score, nine to 10, so the rope score goes from zero to 10, the higher the probability, almost 88%, that that stroke that the patient suffered is due to the PFO. So when we have these patients, we can actually do a rope score and we can calculate, like you see in the middle, the probability that that stroke is due to the rope score. Now, I want you to look at the last column. The last column is your estimated stroke 
for TIA recurrence at two years. So if you have a patient with a ROPE score of nine to 10, that's high probability the PFO was the cause of the stroke, but the risk of stroke is low because we know that the risk of stroke with PFO is low. If you have a patient with a ROPE score of zero to three, that means that probably that stroke was not due to the PFO, but those patients have a higher risk of stroke because those are the patients usually in the older age. They have no other risk factors for stroke, like hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, carotid stenosis, or have a higher risk of having atrial fibrillation, okay? Questions about the ROPE score, we're good? So really the message is, I'll come four points high, five point four PFO, I think with the four points is higher. Oh, I see what you say. Yes, that's, your, that's, that's probably me, I'm sorry. That was probably a, a, a typo. Four should be 34 and five should be 38. Good point, good for, who, for whoever got that. Great, great. So remember, ROPE score, use it for patients that have a right to left shunt in the echo that come with a stroke and will help you determine if that PFO is responsible or not for that stroke, okay? Now next, okay. Now, this was very pertinent and we were actually happy that this patient came because my fellow say, oh, Dr. Ray is the American Academy of Neurology which is actually sponsoring this activity, just updated the guidelines in the treatment for patent foramen oval in these patients with a PFO and right to left shunts. So we looked at it and I just wanna point the most important parts in terms of a patent foramen oval. I just wanna let you know that 25% of the population have a patent foramen oval or right to left shunt. So it has a very high prevalence in the population. So, you know, if you're in a group, one out of four are gonna have a PFO or patent foramen oval. So that's really important, it has a high prevalence. That's why we have to determine, is this something that just the patient has, but it's not the cause of the stroke, right? It's coincidental or is it the cause of the stroke? So that's where the ROPE score helps us. But the other important thing is, as we saw the ROPE score, the risk of recurrence of stroke if you have a patient with a PFO is actually low. It's more or less one to 2% per year. Next. And here, um, I hope you can see very good. I want to talk about the PFO and the right to left shunt so you guys will be able to understand, right, what is actually the cardiologist looking at when they do uh, the echoes, either the 2D echo or the transesophageal echoes. So usually in the first month, 27 to 28 days. Yes, we're gonna talk about that right now. Uh, asthma, that's talking about the pathophysiology PFO. We're gonna talk about that right now. So usually in utero, 27 to 28 days post conception is when this septum, which is a separation between the right and the left atrium starts to form. And this is actually what we call uh, the septum primum, or primum, which means first. So actually it starts to form and it starts from the roof of the atria in the heart and starts growing downwards. Later on in B, you're gonna see that the upper part of the septum primum, the first septum that is gonna separate the right and the left atrium, what's gonna happen is it's gonna develop some divisions or fenestrations, okay? So this part keeps growing downward, right? And this part is sort of gonna separate like you see in C, and because it forms some fenestration that coalesce and, and just stay together. So now you have what we call this sort of division. Now, this is the septum primum, and you have this communication between the right and the left atrium that actually you need in the fetal circulation because it's through the umbilical arteries and veins that the blood gets oxygenated. Now here in the lighter green, you're gonna start forming or seeing another septa or another division. That is what we call the septum secundum. Secundum means second. So you're actually gonna see that from the invagination of the walls of the atria, you're gonna start forming another division or another separation or another septa. And that is called the septum secundum. So you're gonna start seeing here that that septum secundum is gonna start growing 
and it sort of encases or surrounds the septum primum in the roof of the atria. It's gonna start growing here as well, but there's gonna be an area exposed. So you're gonna have an area actually where the septum secundum does not totally touch the upper part of the septum secundum. So it's, this is only the septum primum, and here you have a virtual space. So this is the upper part, okay, of the septum primum. The septum secundum finish here and usually fuses here. But here you're gonna have space that is actually a tunnel that communicates the right side with the left side, okay? The right atrium with the left atrium, okay? And this is what we call the PFO or the pater foramen ovale. This area where they're located, we call the fossa ovalis. The important part is that when the baby then is born, usually you're going to have a fusion. Usually these two parts are going to close or seal. That's when the fetal circulation starts using the lungs. You have increased pressure in the left atrium more in the right, than the right atrium. And then there is going to start, there's going to be a fusion, okay? The problem is that in one in four people or 25%, the fusion, the complete fusion between these two parts, the septum primum and the septum secundum never happens. And that virtual space stays there. Now, as you see, it's sort of a flap. Usually it causes no problems because the left atrial pressure in the heart, as you know, usually is higher than the right atrial pressure. So that keeps that flap open. But now you can imagine situations where the pressure on your right side of the heart increases, right? So if you have a patient, for example, with pulmonary embolism, right? That can increase the pressure on the right side of the heart. The other thing is doing Valsalva. When we do Valsalva, when we cough, when we strain, temporarily that increases intrathoracic pressure and the pressures on the right atrium can increase and potentially that flap can open. So for those of you that were asking, what is that about physiology of the stroke in a patient that has a patent foramen ovale is right here. When you have a transient increase in pressure for whatever reason in the right atrium and the patient has a patent foramen ovale, it has not sealed, that flap can open. And if at the same time you have a venous clot, a venous clot, it has to be venous coming from the right side of the heart, that clot can go from the right atrium to the left atrium, and there it can embolize and then go to the brain or go to any part of the body. So that basically is what we call par paradoxical serial embolism. It's paradoxical because the clot that you have is arterial, is not venous. So when are you going to see this? You're going to see this in patients, for example, with DVT, deep vein thrombosis, for whatever reason, right? Or you're going to see them in patients with disorders of the blood, like hypercoagulable disorders, and have a tendency to clot. So they can form clots in different parts of the venous and the arterial system. So if you have a venous clot, that clot can go from the right to the left atrium. So the story is when you have a patient that is young, has a history of stroke, the stroke involves the cortex, right? And the patient tells you that at the moment of the stroke sign or symptoms, he was doing a maneuver like Valsalva, the patient was coughing, sneezing, straining. All that should clue you towards the possibility of a paradoxical cerebral embolism, okay? And Genevieve, if you go to the next one, this is what we see, right? So here, here you see the right atrium, the left atrium, and here you see the tunnel. Here you see that the septum primum and the septum secundum are not fused. This is the patent foramen ovale. You're actually gonna see sort of a tunnel which communicates the right part with the left part, right? So usually that flap, again, we said is closed because the pressures in the left atrium are usually bigger than the pressures in the right atrium. But if for any reason there's a transient increase in pressures in the right atrium, you can imagine this flap opening. And if at the same time you have a venous clot, that clot
from the right to the left atrium. And once it did the left atrium, it can go to the brain. Now in B, you're gonna see what we call an interior septal aneurysm. So this is actually a part of the wall of the PFO that is so a Boeing. So it forms like a balloon or a Boeing, right? This is the septum primum a Boeing or forming a balloon. So we know that PFO can be related as well with aneurysm of the interatrial septum. Here in C, this is what we call almost like an open tunnel PFO. It's like uh, the walls of the septum primum and secundum sort of retract and then this whole sort of stays open all the time, right? It's almost like an ASD or an atrioseptal defect that we see in children. And finally, this one in D is the other type that we can have, and this is what we call the wide, the wide open or wide mouth PFO. Uh, the separation between the septum primum and secundum is usually like an A. Here, the separation is much bigger. Um, and sometimes we see different type of septa tissue that form between the septum primum here and the septum secundum, keeping the PFO open. So remember, this is what we see usually in transthoracic echo, and we see also in transesophageal echoes. Now, the other thing that I want to tell you, what usually we have to do a bubble study to see it. So what we do is we take like 30 cc's of saline, we agitate it in the syringe, so bubbles will form. Then we inject it in the anticubital vein in the patient. And then we see the bubbles appearing in the right atrium. And then we count three cardiac cycles, right? Some labs go up to five cardiac cycles. And then we see if there's any uh, bubbles crossing from the right atrium to the left atrium. And we count the bubbles. And that gives us an idea of the size of the PFO. Of course, the larger the size of the PFO, the more bubbles we'll take. Okay, so guys, let me let me just go here. I have some question. Um, so someone is asking Manny if let me see. I'm sorry, I just want to go. Um, someone is asking, does the rope score take into account the size of the PFO? And, and the question is no. That's a great question. If you decrease the risk of embolism. Uh, uh, for the air embolism. So the risk is usually very small when you do the agitated saline uh, study. The bubbles usually are really, really small and they usually are, are trapped in the lungs. Um, what is the explanation for the white matter changes in the MRI in the patient? So that's a great question, right? Usually white matter changes are either an indication of poor autoregulation of the blood vessels or an indication of small vessel disease. Our patient has history of hypertension. So I think probably that small vessel disease that you see there is due to hypertension. Uh, let me see. Um, let's see what, what the points. And I think I have one more question here. Uh, okay. Uh, Oral contraceptives, so usually oral contraceptives, especially in patients with migraine with aura, we know is one of the risk factors for, um, for what we call hypercoagulable state, okay? I think I got all the questions there. So I wanted to show you this. This is usually what we see in the transesophageal echo. This gives you an idea of the PFO. Remember, 25% of the population has this, and they live totally normal lives. That's why when we see a patient that has a stroke in a PFO, we have to be sure that, uh, you know, we work out the patient to be sure that that is actually the cause of the stroke. Next. Okay, very good. So this is what we went through. Um, and as you know, if we decide that actually the PFO was the cause of the stroke, then we have several devices to close it. Next. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, some studies, um, the PFO closure. It, usually in 2012 was the first study that came up with a Starflex device that we don't use anymore. But it basically, it, it looked actually like, um, you know, like a star. What they, the cardiologist, interventional cardiologist tries to do is go to the area where actually you have the hole or the communication and put a device there so no more bubbles will pass from the right to the left and then you have eliminated completely the shunt. Next. 
Then another study came that year as well, uh, but these studies were negative. So in these studies, the patients, younger patient, uh, you know, then younger than age 60, and they would treat the patient with different types of medical therapy, either antiplatelet therapy, anticoagulant therapy, and then they would compare it with the device. And they saw that there was no difference. So, you know, we were saying, we're not gonna close the PFOs, right? We would just rather treat the patient why submit the patient to a procedure when actually there's no difference in stroke recurrence at four years? Next. Okay, and this was another group, just to let you know, uh, the RESPECT trial initially was negative as well, but what turned around everything uh, in 2017 or 18, there were three studies uh, published and RESPECT was one of them. What RESPECT decided is to continue following the patients, not only for two years, they did a follow-up now and they added um, 5.9 years. So really they followed the patients almost for eight years and here is where they saw the difference, right? When you follow it for a little bit longer, there were less strokes, less strokes in the PFO closed group. Next. And then the other positive trial was the closed trial. Um, and this is very important for the question that they had asked me, the ROPE score, does it take into consideration the size of the PFO? And the question is no. And the question is, right, it should, because we know that that is one of the things that we take into consideration. So the CLOSE trial chose the patient much better and decided that the small shunts, they were not even gonna consider it. Only patients with large shunts are the ones that they were gonna roll in the trial. Um, next. And then the reduced trial, just to let you know as well, use a different type of device, it's called the GORIC helix. But basically um, the trial again was a positive trial. Next. Okay, and finally, this defense PFO trial that was published in 2018, published uh, patients up to age 80. Usually we do a little bit younger patients, but this one went up to age 80. And as you can see, it demonstrated that the PFO closure was actually beneficial in those patients if they have a large shunt, a large right to left shunt, or if they have an atrial septal aneurysm, like I showed you in one of the TE images associated. Next. So this is what the new guidelines of the American Academy of Neurology say. Say, take into consideration the shunt size, right? You can use the rope score, but also look at the shunt size and also look at the stroke, the radiographic appearance. It has to be embolic. It has to be embolic appearing. So those are the strokes that are cortical, that have to involve the cortex. Very good. And they got to the conclusion that the patient has a cryptogenic and a PFO, you can actually go ahead and close the PFO. Uh, this will be beneficial for the patient in absolute risk reduction of 3.4% at five years. There's a risk of atrial fibrillation, especially very close to when the PFO closed during the first six months. Uh, next. And these are the other important things to say. If the patient, um, if you do the transesophageal echo in these patients with PFO, do a thorough evaluation. Uh, I'm gonna go to the question now. Okay, I got a question. Go, okay, so when you do the study, do with the bubble a study, like I explained to you, do it at rest, do it at Basalva, try to define the degree of shunting, do hypercoagulable studies. And the other important thing also is that we can do transcranial Doppler studies now. So when we do transcranial Doppler study, just when we do the echo the same way, we can take a agitate a saline in a syringe and then inject the saline with the bubbles in the anticubital vein and we can look bubbles crossing and see if bubbles get to the middle cerebral arteries. So we can actually uh, check the degree of shunting also with transcranial Doppler. But if you have a patient that has an alternative mechanism of stroke, a higher risk than the PFO, then don't recommend the PFO for, uh, closer. And then it's true, someone can ask me older, more risk factors, absolutely, absolutely, right? That's why you know, that PFO defense trial in South Korea was the one that went up to age 80, but all the other trials that have been done in the U.S. have gone up to age 60. So it's basically more younger patients 
And that's what the rope, that goes along with the rope score. The other thing also is remember atrial fibrillation, right? The risk of atrial fibrillation is greater as the patient's age. So especially if the patient has sleep apnea, is obese, high blood pressure, has a lot of PACs, left atrial enlargement, elevated the NT pro VMP, or the EKG has an increased P way dispersion, all those are risk factors that indicate that this patient might have a risk of atrial fibrillation. So maybe atrial fibrillation, remember, sometimes can be paroxystic, not permanent, so it can come and go. The patient can be in normal sinus rhythm, sometimes an atrial fibrillation in another, and sometimes we need a prolonged halt or monitoring, right? That is called like a zeal patch. We can monitor the patient up to 28 days, or we can do a monitor device like a link. So we, all these things are really important to consider when we're evaluating these patients uh, for PFO. Okay, and I think one last question. Um, but a patient kind of had been pro anyway because of compromised vitamin. Yeah, that's a, it's a good point, right? This patient having the stroke in the right insula, we know that the right insula is one of the areas of the brain that has to do um, with a higher incidence of supraventricular arrhythmias. So that's really a good point. Um, and either way, independent of the side, if the patient has atrial fibrillation risk, like the ones that we have here that we described, you should do the prolonged halter monitoring, okay? Okay, great. So next, let me see. Can you go to the next one? Okay, so we finished with PFOs. Okay, questions about PFOs? We're good, we're good? Okay, guys, so let's see this one. So here you have, um, this is a patient also that we saw recently in the service. She's 600 and she has medical history of hypertension and chronic back pain. She had a sudden onset of left-sided weakness and facial droop. She came very early, right? Um, different from case one that came the next day. She came right away within one hour. And she had a right eye gaze preference on exam, left-sided weakness, and she have a left-sided neglect. So guys, something very important in terms of the neurological exam that it's like an important clue, right? When you have a lesion in the brain that is destructive, like a stroke that involves the frontal eye fields, are always going to look towards the side of the lesion. If you have a lesion in the brain that is excitatory, excitatory, right? Like, a, like an epileptiform area, is the other way around. The eyes are going to look away from the excitatory lesion. So that's why it's important, right, that we, the right eye gaze preference us as neurologists because it really gives us an idea of where to localize the lesion. So remember, when the lesion is destructive, like a stroke, the eyes will look towards the side of the lesion when you involve the frontal eye fields. When the lesion is excitatory, like an epileptiform area, it's the other way around. The eyes are gonna look away from the side of the lesion. That's why when we have a witness or it's a child with seizures, we always ask, you know, the mom or the parents or the significant other, did you see where the eyes were looking at the beginning of the seizure? Because that can give us a clue to localize. So this lady, she definitely was looking to the right side. She preferred that side and she was neglecting the left side. Um, if we would go to the left side, she would ignore the left side as well. Next. She was, these were the medications that she was taking at home, so not many, next. She was not on any antiplatelet or any anticoagulant. Her systolic BP was 170. Her heart rate was 83 and was regular, no fever. She had an EKG with a normal sinus rhythm, and we did an NIH toll scale when she came and it was 17, next. Okay. So she was awake, she was alert, she was answering our questions. Uh, she was a in place person in, in time and she had no aphasia, but she was not recognizing her left side. We would show her her left thumb and she would not recognize it as her or were ignore us. Or we would show her her left arm and she would not recognize it as well. The weakness on the left arm was greater than the leg and she had a left Babinski. So if you recognize that pattern of weakness that goes right with the middle cerebral artery because of the homunculus, 
So when you have a middle cerebral artery lesion, the arm is always weaker than the leg. When it's an anterior cerebral artery lesion or stroke is the other way around. The leg is always gonna be weaker than the arm because the way the homunculus is presented, okay? So she had all the signs of a middle cerebral artery stroke. Next. And this is just to remember the NIH stroke scale is so helpful because it let us all speak the same language, right? It's a scale that we can use when the patient comes with sign or symptoms of stroke and, and we all speak the same language, we know what it means, and then we can continue serially examine the patients and see if this gets worse or better. The scale is from zero to 42. The higher the scale, the worse is the patient, right? So zero is really, really good, totally normal exam. So the higher, the higher the number, the worse is the patient, okay? And it, it, it also, it's the level of alertness, but it also let us measure visual field, some cranial nerves, the motor exam, cerebellar. We also measure the sensory exam and for extinction, right? Or inattention or neglect that this patient definitely has. Okay, so hers was 17, next. Okay, so we localize the lesion and what will you do next? Okay, so let's go, let's go next slide. So the important thing is that she came so early, right? She came within one hour of symptoms. So we did a CT of the brain right away. We wanted to be sure there was no blood. And then we did a CT angiogram of the brain and neck, okay? And we saw that she indeed had a right middle cerebral artery occlusion. Next. Okay. So here, right, it's, it should be the area of the stroke. We don't see much and because she came very early and this is a CT. So in a CT of the brain, if it's blood, it will look white and you will see it right away. But if it's ischemia due to hyperperfusion, or occlusion, you would not see it early on CT. And here in the middle, you see this white, we call it hyperdense in CT line. This is the middle cerebral artery on the right side, and this is the M1, and we can see that white is actually a clot or a thrombus there. And here, we did the CT angiogram where we can look at the circle of Willis and we see a nice middle cerebral artery here with the bifurcation on the left side and right here it stops, right? So this is where the clot is on the right side. Next. So since the patient came very early, we gave the patient IVTPA. And since we found a clot with the CT angiogram, we call our friends, the interventional team, and the patient had a mechanical thrombectomy as well. Next. So guys, remember, right? You can give IVTPA, IVTPA within 4.5 hours, right? And if you find the clot, you can do mechanical thrombectomy, right? From 4.5 hours to six hours of the patient last known well, we cannot give IVTPA, but we can do mechanical thrombectomy. And if the patient is from six to 24 hours, we do special imaging. After six hours, the special imaging has to show us part of the brain that can be saved. It's what we call the penumbra. And if that special imaging shows us that there is a good profile, then we can do the clot retiro, okay? Or the mechanical thrombectomy. Next. Okay, so here, so Emanuela, here is the special imaging. So special imaging means that you need a study that will be a perfusion study. It can be an MRI perfusion or it can be a CT perfusion, but you need a study that will show you the core and the penumbra, okay? So guys, remember when you have in any organ of the body, the heart, the brain, when you have a blood vessel that is occluded, there's no blood flowing or very little blood flowing. Just because there's a plaque or there's a clot or there's an embolus, you have here what we call core. Now remember, core is the part of the brain that is dead, okay? 
Core is irreversible brain damage. That neuronal and glial area is dead, but surrounding the core, you have a penumbra. A penumbra is that part of the brain that if you restore blood flow on time, you can save it, okay? So this is a patient with a favorable profile because you can see here the core is in pink, but the penumbra is in green. So the penumbra, you can see it as a territory at risk, right? Is that part of the brain that is at risk that if you restore blood flow on time, you can save all that brain. So this is a patient that is ideal because it has a little core, but this patient has a big penumbra. This is from another, my patient that had a middle cerebral artery on the other side, on the left side. But my patient here in this case look exactly the same, just the other side. So here is the occlusion, right? And here you have the core and here they have penumbra. This software actually called Rapid, which is CT, does a volume in CC. So it helped us calculate the volume, as you see here, of the core. It helped us here calculate the value of the penumbra. And then we do a ratio. We do a ratio of the difference between um, the penumbra and the core. And then if that is mismatch is more than 1.8, that means go ahead and do mechanical thrombectomy. So this is the special imaging that we have to do in patients after six hours, and you can do it up to, up, up to 24 hours. Guys, if there was no mismatch, if this here will be 100 cc's, and this here will be 100 cc's, you don't do anything, right? It doesn't matter that I see the clot, you do not go in. There's no territory to say, right? This territory is condemned to die. But if you have a penumbra, that is bigger, bigger than the core, okay? That's where you have territory to say that is a good mismatch, okay? So that part is very important. So I wonder, Roxana is asking me how accessible is the rapid software. So we have several softwares, Roxana. So this is just the one we use in our center, um, in our hospital, and it's the one using the Fuse 3, and this is CT, CT angiogram and CT perfusion, and it's called rapid. Um, but there are different softwares and there's a software also for MRI because you can do this with MRI. You can do MRI perfusion studies at well and MR angiogram. So they're different. There are different types of softwares. Rapid, because it was used in different trials, is, is the one we have. We, we were part of this trial, but there's several types of software. Okay, but, but really the idea is if there's a good profile, if we have a big penumbra in a small core, you're gonna save a lot of territory, which indicates that the patient has a better prognosis, right? Less disability and less mortality, okay? Next. Okay, very good. So this is an example of one of the Dawn patients. And usually when they do mechanical thrombectomy, they use stent retrievers. So the stent doesn't stay in the brain. What they do is they go through the femoral artery, they go up the circle of Willis, they try to engage, engage the thrombus with this uh, stent retriever. This, it's, it's very soft and malleable, so it's very easy to navigate in the little tubes in the arteries. So they try to engage the clot and then retrieve it. That's what they call stent retriever. So the stent doesn't stay in the middle cerebral artery, it retrieves. You engage the clot and it goes out with everything. Okay, next. Okay, so our patient did well. She got both. She got the, the IVTPA. She got the mechanical thrombectomy. She went to the ICU uh, to be watched and do the serineurological exams every 30 minutes for two hours and then every hour and so forth. And she improved. She improved. Her weakness now was only four over five and her neglect improved. She was not looking to the right side anymore. She was midline and... Um, and her speech was improved. Next. Okay, next. So we did different studies trying to find out where the clot came from, right? So the important thing is when you have a patient with a stroke, you need to know where the stroke came, right? You need to know where the stroke came so you can do effective 
secondary preventions, right? So we did an echo on her and the echo looked very, very good. Okay, I have 10 minutes. So I have to hurry. I'll hurry, Maggie. And then we did a brain MRI and the lipid panel and uh, for hemoglobin. Next. And the next day we did an MRI. This is the diffusion. So she had a small stroke, as you see here, a cortical and the parietal, and maybe a small one here near the, um, the ventricle versus imagine the territory at risk would be, have been all this middle cerebral artery. So she did really well. Next. Okay, so we, with this charger, all the studies were normal and we said, you're gonna do an outpatient monitoring device a, with a seal patch. Um, and what we did is we gave her this 28 a day halter that the patients can have with them because we didn't know where the clot came, right? Uh, she didn't have plaques in the carotid her echo looked good, uh, so everything looked so good. And then the diagnosis was embolic stroke of a known etiology, right? She had embolic stroke, she had a clot in the middle cerebral artery, but we didn't know where it came. So we want to do an extend cardiac monitoring on her looking for parasystic atrial fibrillation. Next. And then one month later, um, Oh, okay, Elizabeth is asking about COVID antibody related hypercoagulability. No, we haven't seen it yet. I have seen a lot of COVID related encephalopathies, uh, but thank you for bringing that up because COVID does give, seems to be related to a bubble disorder. So one month later, she came to the hospital and now she came with a 15 minute episode of slurred speech and left hemibody numbness, but everything went away in 15 minutes. She was taking her aspirin, she was taking her statins. Next. Next. So she had a TIA now. So now she came with a TIA, which we call the angina of the brain, stroke sign or symptoms, but they go away completely, right? And this is what happened with her despite taking the aspirin. Next. Next. So here, right, we got a little bit nervous because she was taking her aspirin. We have done a stroke workup and she came with a TIA. So just as I told you about the ROPE score, I want you to know about the ABCD2 score. This is a score that is very helpful that it helps us calculate the risk of stroke after TIA or a transient ischemic attack, right? So as, as you see here, it takes five parameters into consideration, age, your blood pressure, the clinical features, duration, and your history of diabetes, right? So, um, so usually you have one point if you're more than age 60, the blood pressure more than 140 over 91 point, unilateral weakness, two points. Uh, if the symptoms do it last more than an hour, two points, and one point if you have diabetes. So if the patient has a low risk, uh, uh, AB, a low ABCD score from zero to three, the risk of stroke is lower. If the patient has a high ABCD score, then you know that the risk of stroke in that patient at two days is, um, is higher. So those patients are patients that usually you expedite or have to admit. So I just wanted to make you aware of the ABCD2 score, which is very helpful, helpful helping us determine the risk of stroke after you have a TIA. Next. And with her, we found in the CO patch, because by the time she came back with the TIA, the CO patch was net, not yes, yes, Emmanuel. So the ABCD2 score tells you the risk of stroke within two days and the risk of stroke at 90 days. So it helps you calculate. So in her, the CO patch had not been read when the, she came with the TIA um, four weeks later. So we, run to the halter station and we spoke with the cardiology attending and we said please check that seal patch for us and they found a fit right so we were like yes okay now we know what she has now we know she has atrial fibrillation and the message here is if a patient has atrial fibrillation the best thing that you can do for the patient is not aspirin or antiplatelet therapy right Atrial fibrillation forms red clots, and the red clots that comes from the heart need anticoagulation. So that's the big message, guys, okay? So if you have a patient with atrial fibrillation, it might be parasitic, which means it's not always there, and sometimes you have to do prolonged heart monitoring. 
And once you find it, that patient needs to be anticoagulated, okay? Either with warfarin or any new of the new dual or direct oral anticoagulants, but usually those patients remember red clots are clots that come from the heart and those clots need anticoagulation, okay? And I think that's the last one, right, Maggie? I believe so, yeah. I finished on time. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, yes. any, any question? I, I, I tried to address the questions and we went, but any, any questions? Anything else? Okay, I think I addressed all of them. Okay. Uh, so uh, someone is asking me, just include EKG as standard work, workup. Yes, definitely. Every patient needs an EKG. And in those patients that you suspect atrial fibrillation, definitely do prolonged cardiac monitoring. Do halters, do CO patch, do link devices, and do prolonged cardiac monitoring. Okay, because if you find atrial fibrillation, you anticoagulate the patient. Not antiplatelet, anticoagulation. Okay. Okay, okay, thank you guys, thank you, thank you.